Hello and welcome to today's video trying to get you the very top grades. These are the 11 things I'm going to teach you today that will make your opinion writing stand out and get the top grades. You will be taught how to start with an anecdote. That's probably a new one for you. It's probably not a technique that your teachers are teaching. You will have been told to use emotive language. You may have been told to focus on your verbs. I think it's unlikely that your teachers emphasised contrast so much, or indeed humour. Hopefully your teachers told you about deliberate sentence variety. And then an easy, easy mark winner that I try to teach all my students from Year 7. Start each sentence with a different word. You'll see what that looks like. Repetition and alliteration and the rule of three or the triplet you will be familiar with. But then there's the knotty problem of how to end your piece and you do that simply by referring back to the beginning. So if you want to see what that looks like, follow the video. And a big thanks to Alini Sadani who made me make this video. She said, I've been looking through the AQA English Language Pass papers and two of the writing questions were on writing an article for a broadsheet. Uh, so I will be giving you broadsheet articles, both from The Guardian. Uh, to express my opinion on a statement. How do you express your opinion in a newspaper article? That's exactly what I'm going to show you. But she asks a really interesting question. Shouldn't they be non-biased? Well, have a look at this updated question for paper one video that she's referred to. But actually, this was my reply. Newspapers are rarely non-biased. Now, what I mean by that is in the opinion places, place, uh, articles, they are not non-biased. They are very biased. It's only when they report the direct news that they have to be impartial. So we're going to begin with an article from The Guardian by Emma Brox, and this was the headline, I used to think I was calm and in control. Then I had children. Anti-rage strategies have their place, but a home full of recalcitrant offspring isn't it. Now remember, you're not marked on having a headline or this kind of subheading that introduces your reader to the story. Your opinion piece is going to start straight here at the beginning of the article. Right, as I'll show you, she started with an extended anecdote. And the idea behind that is we relate much more to people than abstract ideas. So rather than write about parenting, let's say that was your question, what makes good parenting, uh, rather than just give a general um, idea, she's gone straight in with the specific and the easiest way to be specific is to give an actual example, an anecdote, a little story. Here we go. A friend of mine was recently in a fight with her hood as she rushed to put her coat on and get her son out the door. She told me this ruefully over lunch, after I'd described to her a scene from the morning in which I'd found myself screaming, How many times do I have to ask? at someone in my house who wouldn't put on their shoes. The sad thing is, she said, the morning had been relatively calm and she had praised herself for keeping control. Then everything derailed, the inevitable rage spiral occurred, and there she stood, assaulting her own jacket as her nine-year-old son looked impassively on. So that's what an anecdote looks like. Hopefully you've picked up on the humour. If you haven't, don't worry, I'm going to take you through it in a minute. But you can see how detailed it is. So your first job is to invent an exam question. You know, uh, we should get rid of homework. Um, everyone should be taught to drive at the age of... Um, 20 instead of 17, whatever it is, just make something up and then begin with an anecdote and actually try and copy the sentence lengths uh, that this writer does. Let's go into the first point that I wanted to teach you, which is the point of these yellow highlighted bits, the beginning of each sentence. And you can see that she thinks about starting each sentence with a different word. This also carries on in the next paragraph, which is another anecdote. So now you can see why practicing this technique of writing the anecdote is going to be so important to you in opinion writing, opinion articles. Right, technique number one, the building blocks of your sentence are having 
powerful verb. So instead of she went to put her coat on or tried, she rushed. And you get this feeling of um, urgency and that's what makes the verb a powerful one. She told me this ruefully. Ruefully means with regret, immediately using emotive language. After I had described to her a scene from the morning in which I had found myself screaming. There you go, the powerful verb. How many times do I have to ask at someone in my house who wouldn't put on their shoes? You can see a deliberate sentence variety here. This is a really long one, a show-off sentence, I call it where you show the examiner that you've got real control over detail in your sentences. Now remember, this wasn't written for an examiner, it was written for a newspaper, The Guardian. And so they use exactly the same techniques. And then of course you've got humour. So the humour is uh, losing your temper and screaming at someone just because they can't put their shoes on properly. It's just not proportionate. And obviously you will spot other words in there which are deliberately emotive. Now the other thing you'll notice is that emotive language comes up much more frequently than anything else. The sad thing is, she said, the morning had been relatively calm. So you've got the contrast between sad and calm. And she had praised herself for keeping control. And then again, that's an emotive word. It's also quite a powerful verb because it tells us exactly what her emotion is. So I'll add those two in there. We had the contrast between sad and calm, um, keeping control and not keeping control, and the powerful verb I've shown you. And then hopefully you spotted the alliteration, keeping control. So even though it's not the same letter, it's the same sound at the beginning of the word. And that's also an echo of calm here. Now, the other thing that you'll notice is this is what good writers do. They don't think one technique at a time. Instead, they load up their sentences with lots of the techniques, especially the emotive language and especially the powerful verb, because each sentence contains a verb. Why wouldn't you pick a powerful one? And we have exactly the same overloading with techniques in the next sentence. Then everything derailed, the inevitable rage spiral occurred, and there she stood, assaulting her own jacket as her nine-year-old son looked impassively on. So we've got the emotive language of impassively and rage and derailed and assaulting. Did I miss that? You've got the powerful verb of assaulting. You've got the contrast. While she's getting all worked up and assaulting her jacket, her son is looking on impassively without any emotion at all so a deliberate use of contrast and that contrast also brings us directly to humor um, it's quite funny that the adult is losing control and the nine-year-old son is not losing control at all and then the rule of three is a quite subtle version here which you need to practice and it's writing your sentences um, in three parts so the inevitable rage spiral occurred. There she stood, assaulting her own jacket as her nine-year-old son looked impassively on. Three parts to what we're seeing in the sentence, and that makes it a triplet. Then we have another triplet kind of sentence divided into three parts. You can see with the two commas. Before I had children, I laboured under the misapprehension that I was a reasonable person. So this is a contrast from before to now and it uses powerful verb a powerful verb in labored and of course that is an emotive word as well and so is the word reasonable she hoped she was reasonable but now she realizes that she wasn't and you could have argued that higher than average is also emotive in the sense that it was a positive notion um, she thought she was better than the average human being but now that is a contrast and she realized that she's probably worse there is also some humour here that you might not have picked up on because when you give birth to a child, you go into labour. And I think that's why she's deliberately chosen this word instead of struggled. Yeah, so I struggled under the uh, misapprehension. She's used the word laboured because it reminds us of giving birth and pregnancy. A little bit of humour that's easy to miss. Okay, you'll notice a shorter sentence here, a much more direct one. 
And writers do that all the time. They change the sentence variety to give their writing energy because if you can predict what's coming next, you become lazy about reading it. It feels like lazy writing. But if you keep changing the types of sentences the reader gets, it just disrupts the rhythm. It makes it much more interesting to read because the rhythm keeps changing. So in arguments, I went either for sarcasm or serial killer calm. So the sentence variety I've talked about, it's easy to spot the emotive language in there. I don't have to show you. You've got the contrast again between sarcasm or calm. And then I hope you enjoyed the sound of the alliteration there. The uh, sibilance of the S's, sarcasm, serial, and then, of course, the repeated C's, sarcasm, killer, calm. And again, remember, it's not the first letter it's the first sound that makes it alliteration so here you have four techniques in one short sentence again that's what you need to practice overloading your sentences with those techniques here we go again i never yelled at cab drivers or complained about bad service <coughs> so we've got powerful verbs yelled Maybe not so much complained, but definitely yelled. Emotive language, well, obviously yelled is, bad is, complained is. And then contrast against what I used to be like compared to what I'm like now. Again, three techniques in the one sentence. We've had a few of those short sentences, so bang, she hits us with another really long, complex one. Again, that sentence variety. Uh, and I didn't even write that here. Because there were already so many things to spot. Now, the best I can say for myself is that prior to an explosion, my system gives me a three-second warning. Enough time to feel a flash of regret, but not enough to do anything about it. So that last bit, enough time for the regret, but not enough time to do anything, that is contrast. Hopefully you can pick up the emotive words, the positive one, best, against the negative one, explosion. Uh, warning, regret, okay, lots of emotive language, the metaphor, to feel a flash of regret, so the regret here is like a bursting camera bulb, or a light going on and off, or like an explosion, so we've got the use of metaphor here, uh, with the alliteration, feel a flash, now I probably should put hyperbole in here, which means over exaggeration, uh, at, for this bit, prior to an explosion. So she's looking at her emotions. That's a metaphor, isn't it? Calling them an explosion. Uh, so rather than losing my temper, I had an explosion. But that's also hyperbole, over-exaggeration. Let me add that to the list here. So you can see how many times she overloads the sentence with different techniques. I think that's seven just in that one sentence. And again, that's my top advice. Write your own sentences, which are like this. So annoyingly, I've gone back to my original teaching list and I've added in hyperbole and metaphor, even though they didn't occur frequently during the writing. Um, you've probably been taught to use metaphor loads of times. Hyperbole may be new to you. Uh, that over-exaggeration, which is linked always to the emotive language, try and exaggerate more and obviously that happens through the anecdote through the little stories that you tell to illustrate your point okay there's a bonus feature in my video here and i really need you to give me some comments underneath to tell me if this is worth doing in future because i'm going to show you how to learn this stuff by giving you another article and showing you the skills but without speaking watch so I'm going to read you the beginning of a new article, a new opinion piece by Suzanne Moore, again from The Guardian, and she's writing about the role of a grandparent. I can hear him shrieking upstairs as I write. It's his new thing, a sort of shouting. Every day there is a new thing. Every day he changes. Lights and the colour red seem to excite him beyond all else. They make his legs go berserk like a tiny Irish dancer. It's such a long time since I lived with a baby, so I'm learning all over again. My daughter and her boyfriend didn't plan on living with me, but they have been. 
No one needs a lecture on the housing situation in London. It's tough. It's even tougher with a kid. So you can see how she begins directly with an anecdote again. You will also notice that not every sentence starts in a different way, but here the repetition is deliberate. Every, every, it's, it's, it's. She's drumming home a point. So this doesn't happen by accident. So now I've split that paragraph up into its separate sentences, and I've asked you to spot the techniques that are in them. So can you spot the contrast in that one, the powerful verb, the alliteration in this one, and the repetition in this one? And I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm just going to let you freeze the screen and try it yourself. Good. Now let's try it again with the next sentences, the repetition in this one, the emotive language in that, and the powerful verbs. And then in this one, emotive language, simile, which I haven't really mentioned uh, lately, and the humour. OK, you get the idea. I'm going to shut up now while you look at this one. Don't forget, it's easier if you pause the screen. Otherwise, I just sit here in silence, sipping my cup of tea. And now, this is, again, what makes it a really skilled bit of writing. You have so many techniques in a short sentence and so many techniques in another one. Uh, pause it while I now consider how to teach you the ending. OK, please let me know in the comments below if that technique worked. Now let's work out how the ending goes. So this is the ending to that last one we've just looked at, at the grandmother piece. As they prepare to move to their own place, I realise, for I am indeed slow on the uptake, that at my age and in my house I have been living in a love story. It's happened. I have fallen for someone entirely new. So I told you that has to refer back to something in the beginning in order to give it a sense of completeness as an end, this idea of going back full circle. So this idea about love was at the very beginning in that first headline. That's a bit of a cheat, isn't it? But there you go, she still did that. And then reasonably early on, a picture of a tiny creature was texted back. He was nearly born in the car park. You will love it, so many people told me. So it's going back to this idea that was much earlier on in the piece. Not quite at the very beginning, but close enough for you to get the idea that the ending refers back to something you mentioned earlier. Now, if we go back to the Emma Brock article about losing your temper with children, which ended with the sun humorously just watching on as she got into a temper and the sun was just quite relaxed, we'll see how she returns to that same idea. I think maybe it's healthy to lose your temper and then be fine the next minute. It shows flexibility. We got up to go, so we're back into an anecdote again. Again, that's what she opened with, so that's another way of referring back to the beginning, as is the idea of losing your temper. We got up to go, and on the way, on the way out, got stuck behind a man on his mobile phone, walking at suboptimal speed. It's a miracle either of us managed to hang on. In other words, they're just about to lose their temper again. But a lesson has been learned. The miracle has happened and they have become slightly less angry, slightly less likely to lose their temper. Now, hopefully you can see how these ideas refer back to the ideas at the beginning. And that's it. 13 things to make your writing brilliant. Don't forget the most important ones, which are structural, starting with an anecdote at the beginning, ending by referring back to the beginning at the end, and think through which of these were the most popular and try them out. I can't emphasise that enough. Well, good luck in your revision. Do not forget to subscribe or like my video or uh, revise any way you like. Post me something in the comments below if you want me to take a look at it. I can't promise, but you never know I will. And goodbye.